Hi, everyone. You've tuned in to the Brave Files podcast. This is your host, Heather Vickery, and I am so happy to have you here with us this week. It is the middle of December already. I honestly have no idea how that happened, but it's time to gather together, even if it's just over Zoom or a phone call, to connect with our loved ones and to be grateful. And that's why we're doing a New Year's gratitude episode, and we need your help. We want you to give us a call and share what you're most grateful for from the past year. Yes, from 2020, there's always something to be grateful for and what you're looking forward to in 2021. Our gratitude episodes are our favorite episodes of the year. They're the most listened to and the most enjoyed and the one we get far more compliments on than just about anything we do all year long, but they only work if you participate. So that's why we love to have all of you, our wonderful and loyal listeners, participating in this special episode. All you have to do is call 312-646-0205 and leave a voicemail. It's seriously that simple. So why don't you go ahead and pause this podcast right now. Call 312-646-0205 and leave a voicemail telling us what you're most grateful for from this year and what you're most looking forward to for next year. Okay, welcome back. You've made that phone call, right? You you called and shared your gratitude with us? Okay, so let's move on to talking about this week's episode. This week, I had the privilege of talking with a very dear friend of mine, Ellie Dote, about her journey as a transgender woman in an extremely conservative community. Ellie was forced to come out after being closeted for the majority of her life after an undiagnosed illness was revealed to be HIV. Realizing that there were other people like her and that she didn't have to go through this journey alone and also that she wanted to be a beacon of light and hope for others has brought Ellie to the forefront of the fight for equality and transgender rights. Ellie says she blames her HIV status on the inability to talk to others. She was forced to go out and seek answers to her very many questions alone in the shadows. Now she shares her status because she wants people to realize that this is what happens when we don't make room to talk openly about our identities. These conversations are crucial so that folks aren't forced to hide in the shadows and endanger their own lives. This conversation is about truly understanding that your brave step push other people closer to being brave themselves, that you can be a beacon of light and support for others. You simply never know who's watching and taking notes on your journey. And we each process our journey on our own in our own way. Your journey is brave, even if it looks and feels messy. Now here's the show. Identity, humility, and growth. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Wow, friends, you are in for a treat this time. This episode is so special to me. This week's guest is my dear friend, Ellie Dote, and I have been waiting to share this story with you for a very long time. When I first met Ellie, she was newly out as her authentic self, who happens to be a transgender lesbian. But even among the painful and challenging coming out story she was experiencing, she had some other big, scary things going on in her life. And she wasn't quite ready to tell that story. And I said, you let me know, Ellie, when you're ready to tell the story, I'm ready for it. And we are finally here together. Uh, Very few people in the world do I know who are as brave as you are, Ellie. I am so excited to have you here. Welcome to The Brave Files. Well, thank you so much, Heather. You know, I 
it's so funny that you say that, that you think that I'm one of the bravest people that you know, because I've been listening to your podcast and I'm listen, like putting, balancing myself out with, you mean braver than the, the 9-11 um, person that you had on? <laughs> and I'm like, oh. Well, Mike was a special case. That's a, that's a true story. I don't, I don't see it, but a lot of it is to that it's, that it's out of necessity. Sure. Brave out of necessity is a real thing. But I actually love you say that. This is totally not how I plan to start this conversation. But that's kind of the whole point of this show is that bravery looks different for everybody. It feels different for everybody. But what it has in common for every single one of us is that by stepping into our brave and by making brave choices, we live better, happier, more authentic lives. Uh, and, and that's to me, that's the whole point is you get to decide what your brave step is going to be. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, yes, I love that you said that. And there's no, you know, one of the things that I do as a coach and as a parent and as a friend is like, there's no comparison. Like you get to be brave. And Mike Cortez, our 9-11 first responder firefighter, was most definitely brave, as is everybody in between. So let's give folks a little bit of a background story. We... um We've had a number of transgender folks on the show. It's something that's really, really important to me is making sure we share everybody's stories. And as a member of the LGBTQ community myself, I really want to highlight some stories of people that um, I, we want people to see and hear themselves or maybe their children to imagine. We have a couple of listeners I know who potentially have some transgender children and that they don't have any role models. They don't have anyone to talk to or anyone to connect with. And so my first question for you is, um, we, and, and I kind of know some of this, but the guests don't, so we have to go back. <laughs> when did it feel like something wasn't as you perceived it should be for you in your life? You know, I I thought that there was something different from a very early age. So I looked back all the way through to my kindergarten years, and like I didn't think anything that was necessarily wrong about it but all of my friends were girls i didn't have many friends that were boys and on the playground i was socializing with the girls not with the boys yeah there was a lot of teasing um that happened through that time and in fact one instance that i remember clearly was that there we had career day in kindergarten and I remember walking in with my best friend, Kim, and we had the room divided into two sections. There was the beauty salon and there was the barbershop. <laughs> and of course, where did I end up? I ended up in the beauty salon, um, right. getting my, you know, I loved sitting under the hairdryer and getting my nails painted with that clear play la uh, lacquer and, <laughs> uh, you know, just all the fun stuff that happened with that. But I didn't think that there was anything wrong with it until we had a parent teacher conference. And, and teacher I just want to chime in and say, of course, now we can say there isn't anything wrong with it. Oh, yes. Yes. But Definitely. somebody told you, we are about to share with us, that that, that was wrong, that you shouldn't well, be behaving that way. That there was a concern. Mm. There was a con they were concerned because I wasn't socializing with the other boys. I wasn't playing on the playground. I wasn't playing ball with the other boys. I wasn't roughhousing or doing whatever boys do. And that was the first time that I thought that, wait, this this is there's something to be concerned about here? And I just kind of internalized that. Of course you did. Who wouldn't? Yeah. And, and going on through, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, I was, you know, teased on the playground because um, that trend continued. I was, I remember, um, and I reminisce about this with some of my friends because I'm still friends with um, with those girls today. I love that. On Facebook, on Facebook. And, you know, we were doing flips on the on the bars and cartwheels and that sort of thing. We were all into gymnastics and Mary Lou Retton had won um, the gold medal. <laughs> and yes. yes if that dates myself, um, <laughs> you know, and, and so it was a bit, you know, there, were, it was, that was just how my life progressed. And I had to just endure the teasing of, oh, you're gay. And that started this whole mentality out that said, what if I am? Well, 
And and this was during that time period, mind you, that um, AIDS had just come on the scene. It was a big deal. So it's pretty deal. scary to be gay, yeah. to be a gay boy, yes. which you were born a boy. Yes. Anatomically, that is. Yes. Right? Um, you weren't. You were born you. You were born Ellie, but your your body told you otherwise at that time. And the doctors and the teachers and your yes. parents. Yes. And so I tried to figure out, well, then, if I'm not fitting in in my social circle in the playground, then where am I going to find the place where I'm accepted as me? And that ended up being in music, specifically church music. Right. So, okay, now that's interesting. That's actually something uh, we, we've obviously talked about your religious background, and I do want to delve into that in a little bit. Mm-hmm. But I was always under the impression that your family really drove the evangelical Christian bus. Are you saying that that you drove that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I actually was raised Catholic. Um, and I got into church music because my uncle was involved in church music and was heavily involved in the L.A. Archdiocese. And so I found a place there because I played the piano and started playing at our local parish. And it was, you know, that was a place where I was accepted as me. Where sort of. Kind of, yeah. It was <laughs> it was basically that I have a talent and people saw yeah. me as that talent. I was the pianist and I was the musician. And that's how I kind of existed for a good portion of my life. It became a, a really core value, a really core part of your life. I know that. It's funny that you say that. I do believe that in some way we give, and I'm going to, I'm using air quotes, we give people a pass for being eccentric when they are artists, like either musicians mm-hmm. or some sort of creative. Oh, they're, they're just eccentric. And they can somehow write off or ignore or excuse any behavior that they deem inappropriate because you're a, a musician or an artist. And I had to laugh. I have a good friend who's super, super, super uh, Christian and happens to be a black woman. And she was like, well, you know, being gay in the black community is harder than in a lot of communities. We all know that our music directors, our choir directors are gay. It's just that nobody talks about it. Well, yeah. And... and <laughs> Um, I, it, it's really, it ended up being where I fit in and that's, and as, you know, as high school goes and hormones Mm -hmm. kick in and Mm -hmm. puberty kicks in, a lot of those questions started coming up of, am I gay? No, I I don't want to be gay. I, I can't be gay. Um, were you attracted to boys? No. Okay. So you didn't feel gay. You just no. felt different. I felt different, and I, but I didn't know any gay people. Yeah, and oh, I know. So, so you know, I ne- I never thought that it was an attraction thing. I thought it was just something of like, oh, I fit in. Um, I fit into this group, and so I began searching for places where I could fit in that didn't involve my my sexuality, and that of course was church. Yeah. So I got heavily involved with music ministry. And I kept trying to pursue that more and more and more. And it got to a point where church wasn't making it go away. Church wasn't helping me reduce my level of femininity. And in fact, it was becoming more and more of a battle. And so um, my senior year, I left um, an all boys Catholic school. Wow. Um, that I had, <laughs> yes, that I had spent three years at and um, ended up at a public high school where my first friends were evangelical Christians. And they introduced me to this whole idea of, well, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship with God. And I thought, well, maybe that's why I'm still struggling with this. And I sat and I would listen to these these stories from um, the church that I was attending um, with them. I would go and visit their church from time to time when I wasn't working at my church. And I would hear these stories of drug addicts that had overcome their addiction to drugs because of their relationship with God. And, you know, 
um, men who were abusive towards their wives and God saved them. And so I thought, well, may maybe, maybe this is, this is what I need. And I remember there is a, a specific sermon that I heard and this pastor had a glass of a, a clear glass on the podium and he put it in a tray like a dish tray and he mm -hmm. put a scoop of dirt into it and he said this glass represents you and this dirt represents sin and he started by taking out a couple of pitchers of water and he started pouring this water into the glass and he said and this water represents god and you see, if you have sin in your life, you just need more of God in your life oh, to get boy. the sin out. <laughs> and, and so, you know, here in Southern California, mm. I don't know how it is in Chicago, but in, in um, Southern California, there is no shortage of evangelical churches. Um, some of the biggest church evangelical groups. Oh, they're everywhere, e unfortunately. Some of the biggest evangelical groups have their base here in Southern California. And so, of course, you know, more of God in my head equaled more of church. And that ended up being, well, then there's a church, there's a Bible study every single night of the week. And so I was going oh every gosh. single night of the week. I was, and that wasn't enough. I started um, working at a church and then I went to Bible college thinking I needed to get into full-time ministry. And um, it kept going and going. And you and did going. go into full time ministry. That became yes. your career. Yeah, it was. Um, and I was a pastor for about a year and a half. I lost that job because we had a falling out with the pastor, um, with, the, with the senior pastor. I was the associate there. And I went on to take a full time job as a graphic designer at a church up in the Bay Area. And it was at that point that I just completely burnt out. Sure. I, I said, you know, I can't do this anymore. Um, and so as I began to burn out on my faith, which in essence had been keeping me busy. Distracted. Yes. Mm -hmm. All those questions started flooding back. The problem was is that I was working at this church and that's, you know, we we're away from friends, we we're away from family. And I, if I, if I admitted that I was dealing with this struggle, then that could be it. And you did, you wouldn't have anyone, you wouldn't have a community, you didn't have family, mm -hmm. you would have been alone. Now, I, I know that you uh, were married yes. uh, to a woman yes. and had, have you have children? Yes. Where in this had you met your wife yet? Yes, I had met her. Oh goodness, while I was in Bible college. Okay. So were you already married at this time? Yes. Okay. And so you are terrified to ask questions to figure out what's going on because you don't want to lose the only community that you've got. Mm -hmm. um, but you did start to try and explore some things because you couldn't quite live without answers either. Very right? true. I, yeah. Um, on the other hand of things, I couldn't turn to the LGBT community to ask those questions too. Now, this happened around the same time in California as the Prop 8 battle where oh, yeah. we were voting on um, the issue of gay marriage. Yeah. And during that point in time, I remember specifically that there were people who were involved in non-affirming areas, um, churches or, you know, jobs that um, were being outed. They were being fired. They were being blacklisted. Yeah. They were being publicly humiliated. Their families were threatened. And so I felt, well, I can't go into the, the, go to the LGBT community and say, hey, listen, I think think that I might be dealing with this, but yeah, I work for that church down the street that is, you know, arguing right. against the fact that Hypocritical. you... Hypocritical. Yes. Yeah. And so it put me in this really bad space of saying, well, I need to ask these questions. I need to find answers. Well, where do I go? And of course, I, um, the only place I could go was, um, anonymous strangers. Yeah. I, I, I have heard from a number of, particularly from men, um, 
that that's a, a terrifying and very common, you know, I don't know where to go. And so there's there's a whole kind of underground journey there where you meet secretly and privately and explore, right? I don't know. Yeah. And in the Bay Area, there there's no shortage of places to do that. Um, and in fact, I ended up in um, what's known as a bathhouse up in the San Jose area and realized in the middle of that experience that I wasn't attracted to men. But you were, you were having sex with men. Um, that night, yes. Yeah. And, um, but I, I just didn't know what to do with that. And it, it actually made me more confused of, well, then. Sure. Well, then what the hell's wrong with yeah. me? Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I remember clearly crying out to God and saying, God, what, what the heck? Are you, are you, am I the only gay guy that is not attracted to men? I mean, oh, what the heck? Sweetheart. <laughs> So it drove me to a deep depression, and I was battling depression um, and had to go on the regiment of antidepressants for the next 10 years. And um, Oh, my God. It was another 10 years before? Mm-hmm. So, okay. I don't, I don't mean to cut you off. No, no. Go, go. I, okay. So... You have, you're, you're exploring, you're trying to figure out, like, where can I find happiness? Where can I find what feels like the right thing for me? M- sleeping with men wasn't it. That's not where your attractions were. Did it ever occur to you? Like, uh, did you know, did you know any transgender people? Were you, had you seen, I mean, back then, it really just was so super uncommon. And I, yeah. I completely get it. But was there ever an inkling that you maybe were a, a woman? No, not at all. So, what happened for you to go, wait, hold up. Actually, I'm not gay. I'm straight. I just am not a man. Well, that 10 years passed and um, I had kind of put all of that behind me and said, I just don't know what I am. I don't know what I'm dealing with, but um, there's something wrong with me. And towards the end of those 10 years, I started um, developing sores. But we were, I was, you know, I was doing work at a, at a water park and, you know, as, as water parks go, I just thought, oh, well, you know, it must be the chlorine or it must be, you know, too much bacteria in the water, whatever, ha- whatever, you know, happens with, with water parks. And so I didn't really think anything of it until it started getting worse and worse. And it got to a point where I had, um, and I'm sorry for being too graphic here, but no, okay. um, I had sores that had formed in the back of my throat and I couldn't eat. And so by the time um, the doctors said, let's do some lab work, I was down to about 95 pounds and oh um, basically fading in and out of consciousness quite often. In fact, it was a running joke around our house of, okay, well, we're going to all go to so-and-so's house, and Ellie, there's a nice couch that you just sleep on over there, or, you know, Daryl, um, at that point in time. But That, that was super – You thank you. You did not have to share your dead name oh, if you I, I, didn't. I'm not, I'm not ashamed of it at all. Okay. It's part of my life. Thank so. you for trusting us. Okay. Uh, not funny that you're like nearly passing out and, and have open leisures. And so the doctors, what, what were they doing to try and, and figure out what was causing your problem? Well, you know, I, that had been 10 years since I had had that experience in the bathhouse. And, um, and so I hadn't, I didn't connect it at all. I just thought it was a water park. And so they were treating it with antibiotics and ointments and that sort of thing. And nothing worked. And so they finally had done some lab work. And I remember I had had to take some time off of work just because I was so sick. And I had finally made it back into the office when I got the call from the doctor who said, I need you to come in and I need you to come in now. And I remember arguing with the doctor going, you know, I just made it back into work. I am out of sick time. I don't, you know, I can't afford to be gone. Can't you just tell me over the phone? And and he said, no, I need you to come in. 
and the seriousness in his tone, I knew something was wrong. Yeah, terrifying. But in my head still, I didn't register anything other than, oh, goodness, they found cancer. I have cancer. I'm going to die. And that's not to belittle anybody that has cancer. I, I, re I really want to make that Absolutely. clear. Absolutely. <laughs> but there was nothing else that occurred to you yeah, that could have been that definitely. tragic. Definitely. Yeah. And I remember thinking that the entire way to the doctor's office and the doctor sat me down and said, well, your lab work came back and you're HIV positive. Mm. And quite honestly, the first, the only thing that I heard right then was you don't have cancer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good. And, and so I, it didn't really register with me for for a while. I just, I, you, you are like the luckiest person I know to have had HIV for 10 years untreated. And although you sound like you were near your deathbed, you did oh, not die from it. I, I should have been. I mean, it sounds like by by the time that they caught it, and I don't know if you know um, how HIV works, but the, by the time they caught it, my T cell count was down to twenty six, and my viral load was over four hundred and forty thousand. Oh my god! Which is just basically off the charts. The doctor said, "You know, I don't even know how you how you're alive," and. Um, they started me on medication, and it reversed horse very quickly. I was Amazing. astounded at how, you know, how all of that just reversed. And I'm now in a place where it is, where the virus is undetectable in my system. That's incredible. Which means... Science is incredible. Well, I know, right? It, which means that I can't transmit it. Even if I, I can't. yeah, even if wow. I have unprotected sex with somebody else, you know, I, I can't transmit it. And my T cell count has been steadily rising ever since. But a normal person's T cell count should be around 1500. And so 26, you can, you can kind of guess that that's not, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, miraculous. So you have to fight to get your physical life back and yes. then you also have to tell your wife what happened yeah and when i did and that wasn't easy um it began the questions of well then okay normal straight men i mean that's not to say normal i don't like i i should have <laughs> said that word uh but straight men don't normally go out and have to figure out am i am i gay or not so what what's going on and i spent a lot of time going i i honestly don't know but it began it gave me the the permission to start looking and start trying to figure it out and uh through the magic of google I I found the first stories of some people who had trans <laughs> had transitioned. I love that Google is what made you realize that you were transgender. Well, that's yes. such a <laughs> modern day story, isn't it? Like it so is. And I and Google. I had heard of the trans community by that point in time. It, I, it okay. wasn't that I was oblivious to it. Um, I had been away from the church for ten years, and you know we were we were kind of involved in all these different. Um, spaces, not necessarily the LGBT community, but um, but we were aware of the trans community. But in our small little town of Fresno, the trans community was not necessarily the visible trans community. Were kind of weird, for sure. Um, I mean, I think in so many communities, still trans folks are uh, invisible. Yeah, the trans community that that were visible were basically a borderline drag, and and I I didn't relate to that at all. So yeah, I you yeah. know I kind of dismissed that. I was going, oh, I know they exist, but you know that's not me. Until I started reading these stories of people who had transitioned, and I began realizing, oh my goodness. I, I'm not alone in this in this experience mm. from you know my kindergarten days. And so 
story after story I started reading and, you know, the Google brought up those those quizzes, you know, kind of like, oh, yeah. like the Cosmo quiz of am I <laughs> am I trans? And I kept wanting to wanting to show up, no you're not, but inevitably it it, it pointed to no, this is this is who I am. This is what yeah. this is yeah. What did it feel like when you were finally able to say I I ha- I know why. I have an answer to why what's different about me. It was a relief. Yeah. I I no longer felt like I was alone in this struggle. I no longer felt like I needed to be rent to run from it. And it was a blessing that we weren't in church at the time because I don't th- I think I would have fought against it had I felt like there was anything wrong with it. Yeah. Well, an interesting side note for folks, in the last couple of years, in the time that I've known you, you have been able to reconnect with a church community that is loving and affirming. Yes. And you probably certainly couldn't have done that until you transitioned. And in a lot of churches, you still couldn't do it. So what does it feel like to be back in the church as Ellie? The church that I'm at and the church that I was a part of in Fresno, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, I never expected to be back in church, to be honest. Um, We had a lot of abuse that happened in in the positions that I held at church. And Mm -hmm. it was just so damaging that I just didn't think I would ever be back in in a church at all. Yeah. And it wasn't. But you really uh, sought it. You really wanted it for yourself. You know, I I didn't really want it, but I was working at a co working space one day, um, a female co working space that my friend started in Fresno, and one of the other women in the in the space invited me to her women's night at the church. And she assured me, oh, it's, you'll be accepted, you'll be with me, and it'll be fine, don't worry about it. And, and so I, you know, against everything inside of me that said, no, 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 you, you don't understand, this is not going to turn out good, ended up going. And I had what can only be described as a religious experience that night, and I knew that I was supposed to be back in church. Well, and then you did something that I find incredibly brave. I don't know if it, I think it did feel brave to you. You started going to different women's groups and lots of churches. Yes. In fact, that night after the service, I stopped the women's ministry director and said, listen, I I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I know that I'm supposed to be back at church and I want to know if if there's a space for me here. I know that this is who I am, but what do I do with that? And how do I connect with other women who can help me navigate my faith as a woman? And it started these conversations. Now, going back about 12, 13, 14 years, I was working in a very heavily evangelical church, and a lot of what I was doing was, was in the process of evangelism and the uh, mm-hmm. and the sharing of my faith and and pushing people towards making a decision for for God. And so it's it, it was kind of like stepping into that role again of going, okay, well this is who I am and this is how I see myself in view of your theology. So how how can I re- make this work in your community and it started this process of having those conversations with church leaders in the Fresno area before I moved down to Southern California to really ask that question of where where can I belong? How, yeah. how, can, how can the LGBT community be expected to embrace the church if there's not a place for us to belong in the church? Yeah. Wow. And so you didn't always get a warm welcome as you were joining these women's groups. Tell us a little bit about, I mean, do you feel like that was just fucking brave, man? Because that, I, you know, at that point, I just knew that I, um, that that's what I was needing to do because nobody else was doing it. 
And on top of that, I really oh. did want to find a community. Um, I love you. You were like, oh. I need to do it because nobody else was doing it. I Somebody had, had to do it. I had it. never had anybody come up to me when I was in ministry and and explain to me why they wanted to be a part of our community. Wow. Instead, it was um, there were a, was a lot of combativeness, and that's mm-hmm. basically how the church has perceived the LGBT community. Sure. That we are there to, and, and this is one of the things that I heard in my, not all the way back to my time in Bible college, that the, that the LGBT community's goal is to close down the church. And that's not the case. We're wanting a space to fit in. We're wanting a space to belong. And it's heartbreaking that we're told that we have to choose one or the other. Yeah, it it is not the case. It's, I mean, it's ridiculous. There's so much diatribe within the Christian church in particular, um, just bullshit stories of the quote unquote agenda of the LGBTQ community. Um, I just, I get very angry. We won't get into that right now. <laughs> but you, you put yourself continuously in the middle of situations, in the middle of conversations where you knew there was a good chance of pushback. But I would, and, and I think you got some, I but you did. also had some really lovely surprises. Can you tell us, um, share a story with us about maybe where you opened somebody's mind or changed their mind or anything? You know, what's funny is that the, the first church that I ended up at where I went to that woman's event, mm-hmm. little did I, I knew of the church because having been a pastor in the, in the Fresno area, I knew a lot of the church leaders in a lot of the bigger churches, and this was one of them. I knew that they were conservative. I, however, did not realize that they were Southern Baptist. Mm. And I, I had an opportunity to re- meet regularly with um, one of the pastors on staff, and we we had good conversation about, well, how do I reconcile this? And can you, in good faith, hearing my story and hearing where I am, tell me that I'm doomed to hell because of my because of my identity? And they had to admit that no, no, that's, that's amazing. So you know, while they they didn't change the church's stance, and while the church still holds to uh, a pretty conservative viewpoint. I have faith that it has opened the doors and opened their eyes to the very real reality that how they treat the LGBTQ community matters and how they approach how they approach us. And you know, it, at the end of the day, what really is um, how it is for me. I know that I'm walking into areas where I might not be welcome. But it's not much different from me being out in the street trying to tell people about Jesus. There you go. That's a pretty great perspective. Okay, so switching gears just a little, um, you tried really hard to make it work in your marriage. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. No. Uh, Been there, done that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, For for probably a myriad of reasons, um, like is the case for me and with most people. Moving forward, though, like, well, I guess actually one question I want to have is how did your family, your parents, handle your coming out and your children? Um, The kids, that was funny with the kids, and it's kind of evolved over time. But at the beginning, they were involved in theater groups. They were involved in groups that were LGBT friendly. And their peer groups ended up being ones where they would meet at lunch and they would sit around and talk about their identities and their the issues and the struggles that they were having. But the, they would commiserate over, but, but my parents would never understand. And so when I came out, immediately it was, oh, you have the whole parents. <laughs> so... <laughs> So it's evolved over time to um, 
to be a little bit of um it's 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 evolved over time and my um unfortunately my middle child is not talking to me now um oh, and i don't really i'm sorry you know it it we're working through that and trying to and praying and hoping that that you know it resolves itself later on as things do happen yeah and you also have a, a child who identifies as non-binary. Yes. Um, so my middle child is trans, and my my youngest is non-binary, and we've had a lot of good conversation about, you know, what does this mean? And and I accept you no matter what. Um, and that's ba- really the essence of, of parenting them. Yeah, it is. And you... Um... You made a big change, right? You finally moved forward with the divorce, which was really painful for you, mm-hmm. and moved back in with your parents, which is kind of a gutsy thing to do, I think. Yeah. Um, but how do you? How are your parents with everything? Um, it's it's been a change, but they they've learned to accept it. I actually came out uh, to them about two years before I moved in. And so they have a little bit of time to adjust to that. Um, and it helped that we had the kids in the balance. Um, sure. Because I, I know that if they hadn't accepted me, that we would probably not keep in contact with my parents. Yeah. Um, and so that, has, that was a big help. Um, when my sister got married back in... Oh goodness, was it May of last year? Yeah, May of last year. I had a lot of relatives that came up to me and came up to my parents and addressed me using she, her pronouns and Mm. talking to my parents about their daughters. Um, And I think that really solidified in their mind that, oh, that's right, Ellie's our daughter. Yeah. You know, that's a magical moment. I haven't had that moment, obviously, because I'm cisgender. But uh, when my family basically said i don't understand but i love you when we came out to them it gave my own mother such peace of mind because i think her biggest fear was that i would be persecuted or she would be persecuted Mm -hmm. because of me um and it's a game-changing moment when everybody else helps your own parent realize this is going to be okay yeah 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 all right so i do want to ask you um when we first met several years ago We had a really lovely conversation, and you shared all of this with me, including your HIV-positive status. And at that time, you, to protect your family, you were not ready to share it, which was perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Everybody has to share their story in their own time frame. What changed in your life? This is not your. This is not your coming out of. Uh, story. This is not your debut moment sharing the story. You have subsequently shared oh, yes. it multiple times. But what shifted for you that you decided you wanted to be open and honest about your HIV status with folks? You know, at th- at the end of the day, what what I blame for my HIV status is my inability to talk. My mm. the the fact that I had to go seek out answers to those questions in the shadows. And it, and I share my HIV status because I want people to realize that this is what happens when we don't make room to talk openly about it in, in families, in churches, in, in modern day society. If we don't provide a safe space, people are going to have these questions wherever they are. And it's important to me that we have those conversations here so that and make it a safe space so that yeah. we're not forced to go into the shadows to, and endanger our lives. I, I, it scares me now to think of what could have happened. Absolutely. Oh, I think that's so beautiful, Ellie, that you want to help people not have to live in the shadows and that your story, uh, I'll give a shout out to a woman I know named Pasha. Hey, Pasha, if you listen, she said something earlier today that she said, when we tell our stories, we liberate others. Yes, yes. And I really loved that. And I know for a fact that your story is liberating others. And you've written a book 
about your story. Yes, and as as luck would have it, I know that when we had talked earlier, I said it's it's about ready to be published, uh, and I had this <laughs> whole plan of self publishing and everything. And then, of course, as things go, um, a friend of mine said, "Hey, this publisher is looking for submissions, and um, they're looking for new authors, and I think you should submit something." And so I did, and um, we're in conversation to to look oh, at going wow. through a public publisher which now pushes the book out a year or two more because of that process so right. I, I'm I'm going back and forth because I do feel like I want my story out there but I also feel like going with a publisher adds to the distribution of it and so it's sure it, is it a is it a small publishing house it's or a, a big small publishing house, house um, through a church uh, through okay. a denomination, but then that means that this denomination, which at this point is only 10% affirming of LGBT wow. people, would find this book in their recommended list. Holy cow, that could be huge. Yeah. That's really exciting. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah. I'm really excited about that. You should be, and you should be so proud. Tell us a little bit about your writing journey what made you decide to write a book and then how did you actually get it done <laughs> um i had been blogging for a while and that's um and i had been sharing bits and pieces of my journey and the and the struggles that i had been having with my own theology and fitting in and and one night i just said you know i want to start documenting my story and i never intended it for it to become a book I just started writing and um, storing it all in a Google folder and drive. And one thing after another, I looked and I said, oh, my goodness, I have like 22, have 23 <laughs> entries in here and, and it would be a book. Yeah. And so I pieced it all together and having made and done books for other people, the layout and the cover design and all of that, I knew it was a pretty easy process. And so I started with that, and as you know, as things happen, I I was on um, uh, Tinder one day, and <laughs> and I I m connected with a woman that was that was absolutely wonderful, an absolute delight, and we just were talking, and she says, "Oh, what do you do?" And I said, "Well, I'm." Um, I work at Disneyland, and she said, well, I'm an editor, and I go, oh, <laughs> so here I go with, with, I hired her to edit my book, and, you know, while things didn't work out um, romantically in that realm, that was perfectly fine, because I had an editor, um, and so I had to go through the editing process, we went through that twice, that's so cool. Um, and so here I was, okay, now six months after I had initially thought I would have this book out on Amazon, ready to go and say, okay, let's self, let's self publish now. And now here I am back in the spot of going, oh, well, okay, let's wait a little bit longer. <laughs> so Okay. All right. Well, I can't wait. I might secretly have an advanced reader copy of the book, folks. I might just have one, but I can't wait to get a hardback copy and get it autographed and of have course. the story out. I, I love that you've put it out there. I also love for folks who listen, a lot of you are entrepreneurs or business owners, and a lot of you are blogging regularly. And did y'all just hear Ellie said that she pulled all of her blog posts together and had a damn book? You can write the book, folks. You might have already written it. Let's well, just talk to, about that. To be fair, these were meant to be small blog posts, but I didn't want to share them just yet on my blog. So these were never made it onto my blog. And so this is all brand new. Wow. Brand new That's stuff. so cool. Well, this is a great time then to lead into one of my favorite questions. How do you celebrate? And I think, my friend, my dear friend, Ellie, that you wow. have so many things to celebrate. I mean, I could list off 10 things that I'm celebrating for you. So what are the ways, big and small, that you like to celebrate? Oh, just I, having spent the last 17 years in the Central Valley of California, um, and I don't know if how much you know about California, but we have Northern California, we have Southern California, and then there's the Central Valley, which is surrounded by a mountain range. Having lived 17 years there, being 
now 20 minutes from the beach is just heavenly and um and so the beach is my happy space and um i will often find myself at down there and spending time with friends and um my girlfriend yeah do you take the time ellie every day in some little way to pause and take a deep breath and look around you and express gratitude and celebrate for the fact that you exist and that you are thriving and just knocking it out of the park at this life thing? You know, it it's a struggle too, but I try. And that's um, that happens. Um, I've been dating somebody now for uh, four months, almost four months now. And um, we send each other a text message that we get first thing in the morning, and that really helps me to center myself um, before mm-hmm. I open up my email and whatever else. Um, I I see that text message, and it really helps me to to center myself and and remember, oh, I'm loved, and and it's gonna be an okay. It's gonna be okay because I'm loved. Yeah, and it's gonna be okay. Because you're here and you're ready to make an impact on the world. But you are loved and not just by your girlfriend. You're loved by so many. Well, I I appreciate that. And I am am so thankful to you, Heather, too. Oh, well, I haven't done anything. I I mean, I just, I think you're great. (laughs) And I could just tell. You answer the phone at odd hours of the night. (laughs) I do sometimes answer the phone at odd hours of the night. Uh, I'm curious to hear from you, Ellie. Looking back on everything, what would you say felt like the bravest moment for you? Probably going, stepping through the doors of that church. Two years yeah. ago, I knew what I was walking into because I had been a conservative evangelical pastor. I It still haunts me to this day that I referred somebody to um, reparative therapy oh. because I thought that being gay was wrong. And listen, here, here's the funny thing is that I we, we speak out of out of experience, and so for most of my life, I had thought, oh well, you know, I'm I must be gay, I must be gay. But look at me, I married a woman, and I'm fine. I'm not gay, and if I could overcome it, then you can overcome it too. And that and that was my experience, because I didn't know anything else, and so I spoke out of that that mentality. I know better now, and I've contacted them to say, listen, I am so sorry, Um, but it haunts me. I love you for that. Can you imagine how much healing there would be in the world if people who did something traumatic, like recommend restorative therapy, you know, conversion therapy, um, would take the time to go back and say, this was a really big mistake, and I know that it caused you harm, and I'm sorry. What did that person say when you said that to them? Yeah, they had moved on from it. Um, Unfortunately, that was one of the last moments that they had with the church. And that just absolutely crushes me because I know that the church can be a good space and could be a healing place for people. And to know that I was a part of that, it just kills me. Um, but they are, they have moved on with their life and they are married, um, happily to their, um, husband and Mm. yeah. But I love that. I'm sure that it really, really meant something special to them that you, A, felt the remorse and B, took the time to tell them that. Even if they didn't share that with you, I know that had an impact. When we, when we apologize or when we ask for forgiveness, it is such an incredibly impactful thing for everyone but also for us yeah yeah so walking through the doors of that church i knew what the response could very well be um and so it was it was scary i remember i sat in the parking lot for a good 30 minutes before walking in wondering should i just like call it off and, and drive away 
and making sure, oh, do, do I need to go to the bathroom? There's a Starbucks across the street because God knows I don't want to go to the bathroom at this church in a woman's oh event and, and have yeah. that be my first experience at, 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 back in church. And all of those things that, that had to run through my mind, um, that was the scariest moment. And from and it was when I walked into the doors of the church, I just, again, it was this religious experience. Um, the first song that they sang was talking about, um, we are no longer slaves to fear, we are children of God. And that mantra that kept going over and over, and I just knew that, okay, this is where I need to be, and, yeah. and I'm going to be okay. So proud of you. That is amazing. Okay, so we could keep talking. There's a lot of stuff oh, yes. that I had in my notes that maybe we would talk about. Uh, but I really love the way this conversation went. And I really try to keep everything kind of authentic and flowing on the show. So it's time to wrap and I get to ask you what your favorite charitable organization is to support. You know, that's been one that's been kind of up in the air, to be honest with you. I, um, there's been a lot of change in the, um, the organizations that I have been a part of. And so I really am not necessarily involved with an organization at this point in time. I would say, if anything, I love the work that, um, Freed Hearts is doing. And I'm also a big fan of, um, my friend Rocky Roggio, who is putting together a film called 1946. And I don't know if um, how many of your listeners would know, but in 1946, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible came out, and that was the first time that anybody had translated um, the word homosexual into the Bible. Wow. wow. Now, Interpretation is something, isn't it? It is. And in fact, if you go all the way back to the German translation, which is the first time that the Bible had become had gone into layman's hands from um, from the the Catholic Church. The first original German translation translates that same word with the root word of kinder. And so you can kind of understand where that what the meaning of that word was actually meant. Child. Yes. It, yeah. In that moment, when when the authors of the Bible had been writing, they were they were talking about child molestation. There was nothing wow. about homosexuality. But in 1946, you have to understand that this is the time of the Lavender Stare. Mm -hmm. And the, the LGBT community were being outed and, um, and persecuted within our own government. And so it was popular culture. It fit with the culture of the time. And it has stuck. Um, from that moment, the RSV Bible became the basis for some of the more popular translations that we have today, the NIV. Um, but more importantly, it, it became the, the basis for the Living Bible, which is what Billy Graham used in his crusades to give out. So it became widely distributed with the word homosexual in it. And that was not the intention. And so my friend Rocky has gone back with some incredible scholars and um, and is putting together a documentary um, right now. And so I encourage wow. people to support that because that, yes. that information needs to be put out there. So how can we, so first of all, how can we support Rocky? Second of all, I would love to have Rocky on the show if you will introduce us because that is incredible and I want to be part of that project. Tell folks how they can how they can get involved, how they can learn more or support Rocky in this work. That movie is has a website. It's 1946themovie.com. And it talks about, it has a, a trailer that they put together, um, some information about the backstory and how this has affected the LGBT community um, at large, because it's That's really, awesome. it asks the question then, if this word had never ended up in the Bible, then would we be facing these issues that, that are such heated debates right now? Absolutely. Wow. I cannot wait to check it out, y'all. Everybody else needs to check it out. Ellie, thank you for sharing. So we always have the charity that's mentioned by the guest as our charity of the week, and we will connect with Rocky and do our best to support and promote um, 
this really important work as our charity of the week when the episode airs. Sounds good. Ellie, will you share your three words with us one last time? Sure. Identity, humility, and growth. Mm. They're really, really beautiful words. Um, they, they fill me with warmth and joy. And I would say, my friend, you embody them all so, so well. I cannot thank you enough for coming here and spending some time with me and sharing your story with my listeners. Well, thank you so much. It is, um, oh my goodness, it's been something that I've been looking forward to for a long time. <laughs> well, we're glad to have you. Listeners, I I cannot stress enough to you how much the world needs you to live your true authentic self and to support the authenticness of everyone around you, the people that you know and love and the people that you don't know yet. So be open and be affirming and put your your best self out there, the most true and honest version of yourself possible because the world is ready to receive you just like it did for me and just like it's doing for Ellie. And I am here to remind you today and every day to go out and choose bravely. Hey friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash LibroFM. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book And the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author. And it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash LibroFM. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world. We want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called, So You Want to Start a Podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching. 
coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.